lovingly soft to my touch. The others arranged themselves <coughs> along his body, and on Keith's count we lift it out of the coffin. We shuffle up the concrete stairs that lead to the top of the iron crib. We have woven fresh green branches through its black bars, and on top of the tiers of logs inside, we have placed a thick bed of pine needles and garnished it with fragrant pine shavings. Upon this bed, we lay my father down. Gently, Tapira lifts Dad's head to place a small eucalyptus log underneath his neck as a pillow. As he does so, the shroud peeks open at a fold, and I get a sudden shocking glimpse of my father's face, his jaw grizzled with salt and pepper stubble, the little dents on his nose where his glasses rested, his moustache slightly shaggy and unkempt now, the lines of his brow relaxed at last in death. And then, as his head settles back, the shroud stretches shut again, and he is gone. Tapera is staggering up the steps with a heavy masasa log. He places it on top of the body. <sighs> My father exhales one last loud breath with the weight of it. It is necessary, Tapera says quietly, to hold the body down in case... He pauses to think if there is a way to say this delicately. In case it explodes because of the build-up of the gases. He looks unhappily at the ground. It happens sometimes, you know. Keith slides the empty coffin back into the hearse and drives away down the lane where it is soon swallowed up again by the green gullet of grass. The old black grave digger Robert has his hand in front of me now. His palm is yellow and barnacled with calluses. He is offering me a small Bic lighter made of fluorescent blue plastic. It is traditional for the sun to light the fire, says Tapira and he nods me forward. I stroke my father's brow gently through the shroud, kiss his forehead. Then I flick the lighter. It fires on my third trembling attempt, and I walk slowly around the base of the trolley, lighting the kindling. It crackles and pops as the flames take hold and shiver up the tower of logs to lick at the linen shroud. Quickly, before the cloth burns away to reveal the scorched flesh beneath, Tapera hands me a long metal tea bar and instructs me to place it against the back of the trolley while he does the same next to me. We both heave at it. For a moment, the trolley remains stuck on its rusty rails. Then it groans into motion and squeaks slowly down the jaws of the old red brick kiln a few yards away. Sorry it's so difficult, says Tapira, breathing heavily with the effort. The wheel bearings are shot. The flame pyre enters the kiln and lurches to rest against the buffers. Robert, the grave digger, clangs shut the cast iron doors and pulls down the heavy latch to lock them. We all squint up into the brilliant blue sky to see if the fire is drawing. A plume of milky white of milky smoke flows up from the chimney stack, up through the green and red canopy of the overhanging flame tree. She is a good fire, says Tahira. She burns well. So that was how I buried my father. And, and I thought at the, end of this, at the end of this book, When a Crocodile Eats the Sun, and someone, by the way, asked me earlier to explain the origin of the title. And the, the action in the book takes place between two um, total eclipses of the sun. Um, and in some parts of Zimbabwe, the traditional belief is that the, uh, a, 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 a total eclipse of the sun is caused when the celestial crocodile briefly swallows the sun as a, as, a, as a warning to man below to kind of clean up our act before it regurgitates it to show that it could snuff it out at any moment. Um, I want to just read you one last little bit before we, before we get to questions, if, 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 if you will indulge me, if that's all right. Um, from the new book, from, from the fear. When I finished, when I finished the Crocodile, I thought, well, that was it. But after my father died, my mother eventually moved to England to live with my sister. And so I no longer had any direct relatives living in Zimbabwe. Um, but I kept, I did keep up my contacts there, and I did go back and forth, and, and at heart I am still, I think, a Zimbabwe. Um, and in, in 2008, Robert Mugabe, who is a, an odd kind of dictator, as we've discussed before, and so far as he's, you know, he is an ex, he, he's done various degrees, including a law degree, and he's an oddly fastidious dictator who loves the, um, the appearance of correctness, had, had, a, had an election that spun out of um, and he lost the first round of it, and, and, and 
And at that point, it looked like he would step down. And there was a kind of dizzying moment where we all thought that after nearly 30 years, the gig was up. And in that moment, I went back to Harare on assignment for an American magazine, Vanity Fair. Essentially, my brief was to dance on Robert Mugabe's political grave, something that I was happy to do. Um, and that window lasted for about two weeks. And instead of conceding defeat, Mugabe actually launched an absolutely appalling um, onslaught against his own people. It was as though he had declared war on his own people, but only one side was armed. Uh, and it was torture on an industrial scale, is the only way I can describe it. And Mugabe's very canny. Now, he knows that if he were to kill hundreds and hundreds of people in one go, that it might well trigger international intervention. And so the killing is done, dare I use the word, more subtly. It's done in twos and threes. It's done on a deniable basis. It's done, it's done in a way to keep it under the threshold of, 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 of international pressure to absolutely to intervene. Um, and I want to just, just describe to you what it was like entering some of the hospitals where there were torture victims. As I said, it was done, mostly this torture was done on a catch and release base to use um, basis to use an angular term. The people were taken into bizarrely schools, the school system had by then broken down, and they were tortured within an inch of their lives. They were, um, Beatrice Potetra, who you'll hear from for a minute, can testify to this. I mean, they were tortured really to the, to the brink of death. But then mostly, in most cases, I mean, many hundreds were killed, but in most cases, because uh, tens of thousands were tortured in the end, they were then released. And, and they return to their communities, um, you know, being pushed in wheelbarrows or being carried, because many of them were unable to walk, uh, as human billboards, really, to show you what, what happened, as, as examples of what happened, advertisements of what would happen to you if, you if you opposed the dictator. And eventually, some of them did end up in hospitals. Many were too afraid to ever turn up to hospitals. And, this is, and, and mostly they went to private hospitals, because the, the government hospitals are pretty much broken down by then. And this is the scene I found in, in one of the hospitals um, that was packed with torture victims. In Ward 1S, we catch up with Dr. Korik, a Yugoslav orthopedic surgeon who has never been so busy. What he is seeing mostly now is what he calls defense injuries. It's a chilling phrase, one the doctors use to describe the shattering damage caused to your arms when you hold them up over your head in an effort to protect yourself from the blows, the blows of the boot, the blows of the log, the blows of the whip the blows of the rock, the machete, the axe. Now, Mr. K now Dr. Corrick has run out of the metal plates and pins he uses to set shattered arms and legs so he can no longer operate other than to clean up the shards of bone. He doesn't know what else to do. I can't just discharge someone with, a, with fractured tibia, he, tibias, he says, head in hands. In Ward 1S2, are C. Mutakele and Happiness Mutata. The nurse Georgie goes to their bed ends and takes a quick look at their charts, comparing them against her book. <coughs> Happiness has a fractured right leg and fractured right arm and no plates or pins, so neither bone is set yet. If they start to mend, then Dr. Corrick will have to break them again and reset them. They are PEV victims too. The pace of the terror is so fast now, we are distilling it down to acronyms. PEV, post-election violence. In bed 1S1 is Grace Gambeza from Mudzi. She is 29. She has septic hematoma on her back and buttocks and fractured arms. DW, says the chart, defense wounds. She also has a tiny baby that is still breastfeeding. The nurse brings her in, a bundle wrapped in a white hospital sheet, and tries to hold her to Grace's breasts to, breast to feed. With two broken arms, Grace cannot hold her baby to her own breast. It is one of the saddest things I've ever seen. Grace weeping silently, her broken, unset arms lying uselessly at her sides <coughs> as the nurse holds the crying baby to her breast and tries to get it to feed. The nurse Georgie holds up her patient log, shakes her head, blinks rapidly, and takes off her glasses, pretending to clean them. Then, not trusting herself to talk, she turns on her heel and marches off to the next patient. Bed after bed, and ward after ward, on floor after floor, is filled with Mugabe's victims. A hospital full of those he has injured, tortured, and burned out of their homes. As I shuffle between the torture victims, moving from bedside to bedside, long after Georgie has left, and on my return to bedsides here and in other clinics, copiously noting down the details of their experiences, I feel helpless, 
frustrated and angry. I'm not sure what I can do to help. My role is unclear to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I wish there were a better word than victims to describe what these people are. It seems so inert, so passive and weak, and that is not what they are at all. There is a dignity to their suffering, even as they tell me how they have fled, how they have hidden, how they have been humiliated and mocked. There is little self-pity here. Survivors, I suppose, defines them better. Again and again, as I place stenographer to their suffering, I offer to conceal their names or geographical districts to prevent them being identified. But again and again, they volunteer their names and make sure I spell them correctly. They are proud of their roles in all of this, at the significance of their sacrifice, and they want it recorded. I shrink from generalizing what they have gone through, because it can feed into that sense that this is some undifferentiated, amorphous mass of third world peasantry, some generic, fungible freeze of suffering, one that animates briefly as you intersect with it, rubbernecking at it, a drive-by misery that disappears as you motor away over the horizon. And for the first time in trying to work out why I am here, and whether it is constructive doing what I am doing, I find myself settling on a phrase that I have always avoided, a description I had found pretentious, but that now seems oddly apt, bearing witness. I am bearing witness to what is happening here, to the sustained cruelty of it all. I have a responsibility to try to amplify this suffering, this sacrifice, so that, we, so that it will not have happened in vain. I feel too like a prompt at a play. After dozens of hours of this, I often know, before they speak, what they will say next. I didn't write the words, nor can I change them, but I know what they'll be because I have heard them before. Because there are so many who have been through this torture factory, and that's what it is. It is abuse on an industrial scale, with the torturers following a script handed to them from above. There is no spontaneity to this evil. It is ordained from the top. It is hierarchical, planned, and plotted. Mugabe's men have even given it a name. They call it Operation Ngati Pedze Navo. Let us finish them off. And just as Operation Kukura Hundi, which I witnessed in Matabili Land all those years ago, was an operation to shatter the structure of an opposition party. So this one has the same aim. Two operations separated by nearly 25 years, but apparently nothing has changed. Beneath Mugabe's spurious air of correctness, this is the bloody reality. These shattered limbs and broken lives. This, quite simply, is the base upon which the tyrant's power ultimately rests, and it is one of fear. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we're going to shift gears now. Beatrice, if you would join us on stage. We are so honored tonight to have Zimbabwean human rights attorney Beatrice Matetwa, who was the recipient yesterday of the Case in Amori 2011 Ethics Prize. This prize is given each year to an international ethical leader and honors exemplary actions that have influenced the human condition. It was just such an honor to be there with both of you yesterday. She's a hero to victims of human rights abuses, civil society activists, and foreign journalists covering unrest in her country. Uh, she was born in Swaziland and is the first in her family to graduate from college. She served as a prosecutor in Swaziland and Zimbabwe before leaving public service to open a private practice where she's earned an international reputation as an advocate for the repressed, especially those serving under the rule of the nation's current president, Robert Mugabe. We're also joined here tonight by a man in Cleveland who needs no 